Hi, this is Connie Huffa, and welcome to Fab Design Studio. Now, one of the things you'll notice in our studio is that we have a lot of lights. Lights are really important, especially while you're working. One of the main things that we do here is that we have daylight bulbs. Daylight bulbs, full spectrum, are really important when you have a studio or a sampling station or the machines that you're going to be working on the most to test out different fabrics, colorways, and different types of structures so that you can actually make educated decisions without having to go outside and look at it in daylight. When you're working on the machines, turn the lights on on the machine. It's really easy to just do that. Hit LI1, it means turn on the light. LI0 means turn off the light. But LI1, so that you can actually see what each uh, needle is doing. And please don't tie up the machine and walk away. <laughs> I know so many people do that. They just tie up the yarn and they walk away. And it smashes up and they have no idea why. So we want to make sure that you actually see what's happening when you're first making a sample. When something's in production, I understand, tie it up, walk away, or whatever, but, but not when you're making a sample. So in these series, we're going through the different parts of the machines so that you can understand what each one does. Now, if you're a designer or an engineer or a brand or even a buyer, sometimes you're looking at these machines and why aren't they making what we want? How can we not make this a little bit better? Why is this looking this way? Why are the edges ragged? Why are we having lines in the fabric? And, you know, not everybody teaches all this. You know, they get their machines and basically it's a figure it out by yourself kind of thing. There's nobody that really teaches this kind of uh, technology. When I went to college, we learned the machines, we learned the basics of the machines, and that's about it. Some of the colleges, the students are not even allowed to touch the machine. So there's, it's very challenging to try and figure this thing out in a factory setting. Okay, now what could possibly be the problem? So let's look at all these different parts and see how they actually test and change the yarn directions and what can we do? How can we reduce drag? How can we reduce friction? And how can we make this run better? Now, I know that a lot of hand knitters are watching this and I just want to say that even on your hand knitting machine, I mean, there are so many different adjustments. I mean, a lot of it is taken up by your hands and being able to feel if something is running uh, poorly or not, or it's running too slick or too fast. You can actually feel that and I recommend that anybody who's going to be knitting on any one of these industrial machines please start with hand knitting class there are many different places that um, you can learn uh, several of the machine builders there are some local classes even in your communities that have hand knitting classes it's important to learn the stitches and to learn the machines but also you get an idea of actually working with machinery and the machine actually becomes an extension of you. You can actually feel when different things are happening and even though these are all electronic you can still have that in your mind okay this is going to be a coarser yarn it's going to be rougher to run or this is going to be a slicker yarn it's going to be smoother. Um, there's going to be a lot of different things that will be relatable. So keep in mind what you actually learn when you take these classes. You know, the sizes of yarns that you might want to use and what might work with which gauge of machine. Now remember we talked about gauge machine is the number of needles per inch and they vary anywhere from like a one and a half all the way to 18 gauge. There are a few one and a halves and there are very few uh, 18 gauges. Most of them in the industry are in the middle. They're, they're anywhere, most of them are five gauge, seven, 10, 12, and 14. There's a few 15s and 16 gauges, but most of the, most of the production machines are, are in the middle. So what I'd like you to do on your machine or on the factory machine that you're working with or when you visit the factory, I want you to count the number of adjustments between when the yarn leaves the comb, goes through the stop motion, side tension device and the yarn feeder for the basic machines how many different knobs that you can adjust and and um, 
side tensioning devices, how many different times a yarn passes through a guide. Now, if you're using a pre-tensioning device, count those, count the number of different contacts that your yarn comes uh, in contact with during the different uh, passes through each device. If you're using elastic, count all of them, count every eye that it goes through. Now, imagine that you have the capacity to be able to adjust all these different all these different knobs and dials. This is important because a lot of people think that this is 3D printing and it just, it is not. <laughs> you have all these different adjustments and many of them are manual and a lot of them are down to what a knitter actually adjusts. They're not programmable, a lot of these. These are just what the style of the knitter, the style of the factory, and the quality standards of the factory. So you may have to ask questions at the factory. You know, I've got these lines in my fabric. How can we get rid of this? Or this is this is not knitting as as nicely as I would like it. Can we possibly change some of these settings on the um, devices? And um, this might also help them with with quality as well. So ask the questions, and if you're running your own machine take note of every one of these different con points of contact because every one of these points of contact is important to the quality of the fabric that you're creating and when you're making apparel like i said so many machines a majority if not almost all of the machines just a few percentage are sold for technical textiles but in technical textiles a lot of times these things have to be fine-tuned and you have to I test, test these things for each individual type yarn. Now this is the other thing. Each yarn needs to have its own device. It needs to go through its own guides. It needs to go through its own stop motions. If you start running multiples through some of these things, you actually may burn the motors out of these things. But also, if your yarn breaks, your material breaks, you're not going to know. Because a lot of these things, when something breaks, they stop. They, they're electronic stop motions, all of them. So whether it's an MSF3 or it's a side tensioning device or a positive feed device or an ESF920, they're wired into the machine to stop the machine so you can tie a knot and not lose your piece. So this is this has changed so much over the last 30 years that I've been working on these machines. A lot of these things, it's like, what happened? And you don't even know. <laughs> you have to go find it. But at least these now they're telling you where the problem is and that's showing you, okay, here, go fix it. It saves you a lot of time and effort. Most machines are sold for the apparel industry. And the fraction that are sold for technical textiles basically use a lot of different types of devices and may have different modifications depending on the product itself. So no two technical textile machines may be the same. I mean, sometimes things are engineered to have more space in the gap of the needle bed so that more fabric can come down and they have special sinkers on them. Um, you might have different size hooks. Uh, you might have longer hooks. You might have bigger hooks. So you might have a 14 gauge machine, but put 10 gauge needles or 12 gauge needles in there. The same with a seven gauge machine, you might put five gauge needles in just so that you can hold more yarn or it can actually accept more or run without having a lot of damaged fabrics. So another thing that is a really good advice is to look up different types of yarns and start understanding or getting a couple of different books or other classes on uh, textile science so that you understand how the yarns are actually made. So you can kind of understand that each yarn has its own personality. So whether something, something could be made of cotton and you might have maybe 50 different uh, yarns sitting on a table and they're all cotton, but each one has a different personality. One might be combed, one might be carded, one might be open end, one might be plied, one might be a singles yarn. You might have yarn that is an eight singles, which is eight times 840 yards 
gives you how how long and how heavy that yarn is. It's an eight singles. And then you have things that are maybe a 20s too. And you have to compare the different ways. How do I combine these things and get them into my machine? Well, if you make the adjustments on your stop motions, your side tensions, you may be able to run a lot of these things in the same machine using the same, all these different mixed yarns. Now, a lot of these devices might actually look intimidating, but they're not. Once you get used to them and you realize they're there to help you, I mean, they're, they're actually great. And automatically you'll start thinking, oh, I need to use this one, or this one would work better. And they'll become part of um, your just thought process and the way you actually start designing or innovating. You know that, okay, I want to use this material, but I'm not going to have to worry about if it's going to run or not because I have the option of running with some of these devices.